Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Lisa All, and I'm the manager of audience programs at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. We're really happy that you all are here tonight with us to talk about the Fireside Nutcracker. And I'm thrilled to have as our guest tonight, Susan Jaffe, who is our artistic director at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, and Terence Orr, our former artistic director, and Mariana Tchaikovsky, one of our ballet repetitors at PBT. So thanks to you three and thanks to everybody for being with us tonight to talk about Fireside Nutcracker, which premiered last night. We're all very excited about that. Um, and Susan, I kind of wanted to just start with you and say, ask how this idea came to be. So at some point in the summer or spring, we must have realized that we were not going to be in the theater for Nutcracker. And so how did this idea come about? Uh, well, I believe that in April, I found out that I um, got the job as the artistic director of PBT. And right at that time, um, you know, I, I don't think any of us believed that we'd be back in the theaters. I started talking about filming uh, and making a film of the Nutcracker. So we were talking about it early on, um, even before, I mean, I arrived here on July 1st, but Terry and I were talking uh, for months before. Um, so it really sort of its nascent idea came up in April, actually. And so what, what was first? How did we start this? How, what was the process like for create, deciding on the film and then getting going with it? Well, we knew we were gonna do the film um, and I didn't arrive, as I said, until July. And so probably at the end of July, uh, beginning of August, we all met together and um, I sat there with a pen and a paper and I asked Terry um, and Mariana, like, what's, where do you wanna start? What's the most important thing you wanna say? Who are the most, what's the most important thing of a Nutcracker production? And we just started, um, like an editor, you know, because we knew that we weren't, we didn't want to do just a proscenium stage two hour filming of the Nutcracker. Uh, but how did we want to tell this story in a way that was um, succinct and clear and, and full without it being a gigantic full production. So uh, we literally created an outline of what was the most important things and then we whittled away like an editor we whittled away at it and whittled away and whittled away until we got to the, 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 the just the structure of the story. Um, and then we um, added a narration. We wanted a narration. I said, you know, I really want it to have some narration in there. And Mariana said, um, what about the idea of how there's a narrator speaking to his granddaughter in The Prince's Bride? And oh my gosh, we all jumped for joy. We thought that was an amazing idea. <clears throat> and so we uh, actually, Mariana wrote up a small version of the hard nut story um, with many of the characters that you don't normally see in a, 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 a normal nutcracker performance from ballet. And um, so I initially just took that story and just whittled away at it and started the narration that way. And then as we were going through scene by scene by scene, um, we would say, oh yeah, we need some narration here. And that's how it got built into it. It was literally, we, we made a script, a storyboard. Um, and it got built as we talked and talked and talked. And I don't know, Terry and Mariana, I think we spent hundreds of hours um, creating the outline for this work because it had to be as clear as possible. Um, otherwise it would have been, you know, and we had such a short amount of time to get it ready. Otherwise it would have been chaos. So we, we really spent a lot of hours um, all through um, the beginning of August and, and through August to make sure that the story was told in the way that that was the most comprehensive. 
um, and full. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think what, what was very helpful, Susan, too, is that I know like you were on the Vimeo and really seeing this production for the first time. But I think it was really helpful to have that fresh eye because you also could just see, OK, what what's helping, you know, propelling the story forward, you know, kind of what the heart and soul of it is and, you know, where the, the, the dancing is. And I think that was also very helpful in just that editing with the music. And then I remember right sitting in your office and you go, okay, cutting here. And I'm like, had this replay in my mind. Okay, yeah, but, you know, that, that, that works. We can, from there and, and then those places, okay, well, we can finish there. I guess maybe we'll need some uh, narration to bridge the scenes and. Yes, that's so true. I remember we were hours in the, in, you know, just looking at what is what are parts of the music and the scenes that we could pull out instead of doing the whole scene. And uh, we worked very um, um, diligently with our uh, director of music, Yolande Collin, and he helped us to um, blend the music together so that it sounded harmonious. Uh, and he also worked to get all the different, um, with the, a company called Naxos, to get all the different versions pulled together in one production. So he was a tremendous help to us while we were pulling together all the scenes. Were we, and this is something I don't know, were we shooting for an hour or what was the parameter? You know, why were we cutting? Why were we, you know, looking at things to cut? Uh, one of the things, um, and Terry and Mariana, jump in when you want, um, but one of the things we wanted to do was not do what everybody else does, <laughs> which was just a normal proscenium theater. You know, you sit in the, uh, in the audience and you wait for the production to start. We wanted to make it unusual and different. And we also thought that, you know, people uh, are pretty zoomed out and virtualed out. And so we wanted to make it as short and sweet as possible while telling the full story. So um, that was one of the reasons why we didn't want to just do what everybody else is doing. Um, right. Not everybody else, obviously, but where mostly when you see a virtual performance, it's, it's the full performance filmed by, you know, in front of a proscenium theater. Mariana, can you talk a little bit about what it was like to create the narration because you were the primary force behind that and the research well, you did and well I think I mean Susan also kind of you know set a nice template for it as well but I, but I did when I started um well I kind of went back to Hoffman ETA Hoffman the story because I hadn't really read it and I, I you know I've always had a hard time actually getting through the hard nut story and that's why I thought, okay, I'll just like put something out there and um, get, get to the point of it in a way. And, and I thought about trying to tell that story because people don't really know that story, but that really is a precursor to, you know, where the ballet actually starts and how that all um, happened. And I think actually, Lisa, and I think that was great that you, you did mention at one point, maybe we should have some backstory, Grossmeyer's backstory, because really that's why we're here. And um, I think that was helpful. So we got a little, you know, in that opening narration, a, a little hint of that hard nut story in there. I wanna, <laughs> can I interject, Mariana? Yeah. It was amazing because, you know, I had sort of, as we were all talking, created the template and then Mariana would come running into my office <laughs> and she would have these beautiful little jewel of a sentence, you know, that she pulled from the hard nut story. And so I said, oh my God, that's amazing. And I pulled out my computer and wrote it down and like added it into the narration. So she, Mariana did a lot of research over a period of the couple of months um, and added to enrich that narration uh, to how, where you see it today. So, it, you know, it was a really tremendous effort um, as well as work with you, Lisa, and um, Katie, right? Katie, yeah. So. No, yeah. Um, well, like I said, with the story, because there was my favorite line uh, that talks to actually when the Fritz has broken the nutcracker and then everybody goes to bed and Marie's sitting there with him and just talks about all the pale, how he looks at, at her with a melancholy gent gentleness that goes straight to, to Marie's heart. And that just, I you said, know, so I've got to get so, that, that in there somehow. Um, and then it also, you know, talks about, you know, just 
her falling in love with him at first sight, she could just see, you know, this, this you know, kind soul. Yeah. yeah, and that's why the narration was so, enriched it so much because to pull out these beautiful sentences that show the soul of the characters um, really enriched it and made it deep and made it real. Um, so that was really, uh, you know, as I said, it, it enriched the, the story uh, mm -hmm. very deeply. But I did, and I, um, I know one, 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 one morning I did, I like Brian, and I didn't, I, <laughs> we were hardly up, and I came, okay, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> snowflakes, you know, the delicate snowflakes floating from the sky, and, you know, just like the delicate snowflakes, you know, all, all Marie's worries melted away, and, um, but just wanted to get get in there also just about yeah you know that unconditional love or uh, unconditional love and um, yeah really you know just the, the you know the the morals of Nutcracker really about mm -hmm. acceptance and tolerance and not mm -hmm. judging you know something by its appearance and just being able to right. see their soul and their yeah heart yeah, I think that's what really comes across <laughs> in this version about the story because it is Nutcracker is done across this country in so many different kinds of ways but it. It's always about the Nutcracker, and it's not about um, a story as a love story. And I thought that was a very important part of Pittsburgh, besides the fact of having all the nuances of Pittsburgh in, in the ballet. But I, th you know, in this, I'd just like to move on a little bit because I, thought, I felt like the crew and um, the staff and the dancers all um, were tremendous because um, we were entering in to a project during this pandemic. Um, and we didn't know how we we're gonna be able to do it. And it was a daily and it was mm -hmm. an hourly and it was a, by the five minutes trying to figure out, okay, what are we gonna to do to get over this obstacle and how are we gonna get there? Um, I thought we were extremely lucky with the people we had to work with. And, and some of them were very sensitive about the situation. And, and some other people were much more easy about doing it. So you had to mix them all when they're in the room together, they don't always work. It's kind of ha like having oil and water and it didn't want to work like that. So I was very proud about the whole organization working together with it. Um, and also the fact with the dancers, I thought we were very lucky, the fact that we had um, <laughs> several couples um, and it's people several, who right? cohabitated together, um, men and women and um, men, so that we had um, these groups of people that could actually work together without a mask. And that made a big difference because for the most part, you had to have a mask on um, by mandate. And mm -hmm. if you were you know, together, you didn't have to. So it, the casting was just very easy, actually. Um, I, I did it in about five minutes. I think Susan did it in the same, um, and she had never even seen the dancers all that much, didn't even know mm -hmm. the story all that much, but we, Kind of really coordinated with all of that and making it happen um, and it it served itself incredibly um, in the fact of being able to um, put on a, a shorter version of the Nutcracker and to be able to see the very kind of important nuances of this story um, and certainly having the narration the grandfather and the, and the child of the, the and Brett which is fantastic uh, in this and having the feeling of being by the fireside and then going in and out of all these scenes gives it a tremendous warmth and, and charm that helps a lot. Terry, will you tell us about how uh, the camera overhead and how oh, uh, wow. you mapped okay, it out? Well, I didn't know this program was going to be that long. So um, <laughs> <laughs> this answer, I'll give you the short one and might take up a little bit of time, but I, I think yeah, it's right on, Susan because um, we didn't really know to begin with me. When I first went in the studio, I was trying to figure out, okay, how can I make 18 dancers out of eight? Um, and then I thought of some ways of getting it done. Um, and then I would talk to Christian and I realized, okay, that's not gonna work. Um, I have to find a new way. So I'd come in again and say, girls, we get that same steps, different way, let's do this. Um, and of course we really started with the two biggest problems that way was the waltz of flowers and the snowflakes. And um, that was a um, tremendous um, obstacle looking at it and saying, okay, we're going to be using cameras from the front and we'll use three of them from the front, 
so that we can divide up the stage and at least have groups in three different sections. And then we'll have an overhead camera that will tie in um, the, the look from the top. And if it had that kind of motion that worked from the top, we would use it and then and be able to choreograph. So it's really re-choreographing um, the, the idea about where and how you're going to do it. I thought Christian Lockerman was a complete genius and his crew <laughs> were really fantastic to be able to see it because he didn't know the ballet either. And, you know, he'd say, okay, what are we doing next? And um, we would go out and just show him and he'd go, okay, I get it. Um, now let's, we'll do it from here and we'll do it from there. We pretty much knew kind of ahead of time, but then all of a sudden we'd realize that's not gonna work. Okay, what are we gonna do to change? Well, this is what we'll do. Um, and, you know, so you don't just get a chance to just run through a whole scene and then, okay, let's do that whole scene again and then we'll go home. It, that never happened because it just had to be taken apart and to be able to um, discern what you want to see. And, and I think that's what he's a master at too. Um, and, you know, like some of the great movies that you see today are things of the techniques that um, Christian uses where you see something close and then you get the personality and then you see farther away and you see the line. Um, and it's not all broken up. I used to always say, oh, well, don't get so close because you can't see the line. But no, with the way Christian does it, he's getting an emotion. He's getting over the shoulder of the child or getting over the shoulder of Marie looking at the nutcracker or the nephew, um, which are the same. And um, you'd see the differences of what she was looking at. And so it becomes a different kind of storytelling that um, it is uh, a lot clearer um, I wish we could even tell more, uh, but I thought it was tremendous to be able to show the magic and do, and do magic on television, you know, and uh, to make that kind of thing work, to have the characters all have enough of time out there to, to, to have a full character, not just all of a sudden, okay, who's this person? You knew who you were looking at and what they were doing, and uh, you never really lost, so... Interesting project. But, but like Phil also, sorry. So I just wanted to add that the, the turnaround time that we had uh, between creating it, filming it, <laughs> editing it, and to, uh, to the finished product was shorter than anybody had ever suggested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it probably should have taken a year and we managed to do it in, you know, four months. So yeah, I think um, a lot yeah. of people will attest that that's very true. Well, well, the thing too, like film, and also the thing is nothing was shot in order. It was completely, um, well, yeah, out, out of order. So, and, and also like film, there, there was a lot of repetition because he also wanted to get uh, different angles you know, because it wasn't just front on proscenium, but he, you know, he wanted to have you know, the, those options to be able to look at it. And I think for, for the audience that also to be able to look at it from different points of view, which is kind of interesting, right? You're not just sitting in front, you get to kind of, you know, like if you were in the wings or even be behind the stage or on the stage, I will make it. That's probably in a way what it is to, to make. The well, while we were doing it, we found all of a sudden our ideas about, oh, okay, we can do it this way. And then when we actually started doing it, we said, oh, we can't do it that way because it doesn't fit. <laughs> it just doesn't fit on there. All of a sudden, our cameras couldn't get back far enough. Um, we thought we were going to be in a theater and we were in a, we were in a black box. And so the, even the, every one of the cameras, we would love to have been able to take them back and have different kinds of lenses on them to make it work. So um, although it all works really, really fantastically, but I think that's because of the genius people working around on mm -hmm. them, uh, mm -hmm. bring it together. And lastly, although not lastly at all, uh, just to say, say that they were in the theater from like 10, 10 o'clock until eight at night. And that was for the black box at Point Park University. And then at Hartwood, they had to start at sunset and go until 11 p.m. So it was, they were long days long days for, you know, Terry and crew and, um, and for the dancers as well. Very long days. But what was so lovely was that everybody 
felt such a community mm -hmm. and just wanted so much to make this a beautiful gift for mm -hmm. the community. So there was just so much goodwill and so much heart. Um, it was just such a joy uh, to witness. It was a lot of sacrifice for a lot of people. <laughs> the crew it was pretty amazing. You know, they came in um, and if we had a change of cast, uh, we would have 15 minutes or half hour break. Um, they would completely put alcohol over everything, wash the floors, all the props, all the, everything was redone and aired out. Um, and that was, it took time, you know, and everybody, mm -hmm. even we couldn't just go off in, in another room and sit around and talk to each other because you need to get a part two. And so you go off from solo and you come back and think about what you guess. I thought of this during this time and you come and say, okay, this is where we're gonna go. But so Susan knows too. So it actually well, it wasn't easy doing the schedule. <laughs> I know. Oh, <laughs> you come absolutely. in and <laughs> that's right. Because you exactly figuring out trying to decide and also just not really knowing what, what Christian would need. But but about, about those groups of dancers and also just for the dancers knowing of the repetition, it's not like they how long can can they really be there and be able to perform and and um, stamina and physically, you know, also just be safe. Not right. I mean, we should talk about the scheduling. I was actually putting my hands over my face <laughs> scheduling at uh, at PBT, like what it actually took for us to be COVID safe, um, to get the dancers in there, how long it took for us to have them one pod leave and uh, clean the air, the air exchange, and then have a new pod come in. So we had to have in between each rehearsal and each pod of dancers, we had to have a, a 45 minute cleaning. So the whole day was Rehearsal, wait 45 minutes. Rehearsal, wait 45 minutes. And we had all these different studios. So we were running around from one studio to the next um, and creating a schedule with all those breaks in it was super hard. And also, you know, we're as a dancer, director, repetitive types used to just going from 12 to one, one to two, two to three, you know, but we it had to be, you know, it was like a puzzle and the same at the theater. So with air exchange, safety protocols, uh, at the studios, we had wipes, we had sanitizer. Um, every dancer wiped down their bars after, after their bar and then went into the center. We had squares marked out of 12 foot squares marked out. And then um, Terry had to create choreography that was COVID friendly. Um, and when the dancers couldn't necessarily um, be in a distance, they were masked. So uh, it, it seems, you know, when we watched it last night, I was just, you know, so happy and everything, but the amount of work it took to make this work COVID and safety friendly took a tremendous amount of, of effort way above and beyond what would normally be hard, um, <laughs> but it was just 10 times harder. Um, so, but everybody it stayed, like, in fact, yeah. nobody yeah. got sick. Nobody at PBT, knock on wood, has gotten sick since the pandemic. I know that's right. one thing I'm really proud I, 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 of. I, I, we could have I, talked about because the fact that we really took care of everybody, everybody took care of themselves and was respectful about other people, that we haven't had a problem with COVID at, at PBT and that's tremendous. You know, getting back to the schedule, I've got to tell a little personal story. Mariana came back after talking to Susan and she looked at me and she says, you know, I'm a little worried about the schedule. And I said, why? She says, well, I'm not sure you're going to make it. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so she told me the hours of I thought, oh, yeah, you know, well, I guess there's a reason why I retired because I did feel it. But the very first day I came in about an hour and a half early and I was talking the to Christian box, anybody else. Yeah. And I found the black box where I had to start for the filming. And I found myself a folding chair and I put it down, I sat down and I said, this is gonna work. Um, I didn't see that folding chair again. <laughs> <laughs> I never got a chance to sit down yeah. just because it was always a go. You'd be either on the stage doing something or you go back behind the camera, you're watching it to see if it's working, doing the take or you're talking to somebody and there was never a chance to like sit down. 
and you would just keep going. And the energy was phenomenal. It was a very exciting time. So. I know, but but also all the things that he was looking at and they started to go, okay, yeah, good. I said, no, no, wait, wait. They fell off. Wait, we need to do that again. again. <laughs> Exactly. Me too. <laughs> just something. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> or, or the dancer. The dancer was not happy. They, they knew they could do better than this. <laughs> yeah, you're dealing with a bunch of perfectionists when you when you walk into a rehearsal <laughs> or a film. So, so how did the um, the big numbers work with the core? So, like flowers and snow. How did how did that work with the COVID protocols? Well, I first thought, okay, this is, and I first had my first discussions with um, Christian early on, and I said, well, you know, if you can get groups of four, then I can multiply them, and then we can just put them uh, on different parts, and we'll, we'll get it done. Um, well, it sounded good, and some of that was really being talking on the telephone, um, and not in person always, and so I had a different concept of what that meant than he did, and then I found out that we, we like I explained before, the distance of being able to to do it, we actually couldn't do this to the way we wanted to because we ran out of space. And it's hard to explain, but um, we did have, um, because of the people who worked together in class, we had four girls in one group, three of them were actually in one class and one was added in to be the extra to make four girls. And then there was the other group, the B group had the same thing. They had three girls that took a class and another girl. And I had to be careful, especially about the one girl not being close to the other three. And those two groups couldn't be together at all. And so then we start going on. And when you take a look um, and you see different sections, um, this is where Christian was fantastic. And you look at the floor um, and the camera work, you'll see four girls on one side, you'll see four girls on the other, and you'll see a principal in the middle. And it looks like they're all dancing together when actually we filmed them in three different days. Well, that's what, you know, yeah, And there was a camera going on one section and there was a camera going on another. And then we put it together afterwards. I'm sorry. No, 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 I was just gonna say that the, the snow, with the end of snow, snow, that final scene with Alexa in the middle, the girls, that was all shot separately. And I thought, I went, okay. <laughs> it worked really well. It worked really it well. well yeah. Even in the, from the very beginning, there were sections where you just, um, they were never on the stage at the same time, but it looks like they are. Um, and it's, it's, it, was, it was like doing a painting um, in three different studios or four different studios and then taking and putting it together afterwards. Um, and it, it worked. We could probably talk about Alexa also was an added. <laughs> oh, we had uh, new roles, right? right. We, yeah. um, when we started talking and I, I said, Susan, but what are you going to do about your ballerinas? We have, <laughs> you know, um, we have ballerinas that we're not using. And um, so we went like, well, we just have to find something. <laughs> and I'm like, well, we can have three garden fairies. And, you know, and um, we came up with, the, well, with the, winter the, fairy the winter fairies. So, and we decided who should be what, and, and we'll, get to, we'll make up some new roles for them. And that's what we did to get them on there. And it, they look absolutely incredible to see Amanda out there, and Joanna and Hannah and, and Alexa. I was just really pleased. I thought that uh, Diana was fantastic in, in um, doing Marie. She was just a natural actress. Um, it's wonderful to see Marissa and, and Alejandro working together, you know, and their whole last scene in the, in the end of the party and then going up in the necklace. It was so believable, so mm -hmm. honest. I felt like I was watching a movie from Hollywood. The acting mm -hmm. was just uh, really artistic and, and beautiful. And uh, there were so many really wonderful performances in it. I know, I was, and I was impressed with how quickly Alejandro grew that beard for a second act Arabian. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> he was growing that under his mask all the <laughs> well, don't tease the audience. They get completely confused because Sorry. that's why we filmed out of order, just because of him. <laughs> Um, Terry, did you find yourself directing the dancers any differently because oh, of the film? Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how so? It's a different kind of focus. It's a different kind of being on the stage. Um, you know, sometimes you would make an entrance, you know, if you were coming in from the fourth wing and then going off the second wing, there were times when you couldn't do that because I had to um, make sure that two thirds of the stage was not gonna be used by that one dancer. So I could use it with another camera, um, either from the top or from the side. 
Um, and so it, they would run off directly towards the conductor would be, you know, right and running into the orchestra. And that would be their exit, things like that. It's, it's, it's kind of complicated to talk about, but you know, you just have to think about it. You have to look through the lens and say, okay, this is how you're going to be seeing it. So this is what you have to be able to translate to the dancer as to what to do. Were any of the dancers were, I mean, was it, did it take them, you know, were they nervous, I guess, being filmed or was it, did any, anyone express anything? Because there are some, there are a lot of close-ups in the film. Some were more nervous than others um, and, and different parts of, of what they are as artists were nervous. I mean, sometimes it's mm -hmm. oh, about my feet and my shoes or sometimes, oh, it's about my hair or no, it's much more about my arm or it's much more about, I didn't get the three pirouettes and nail it and go mm -hmm. down, you know, um, or what's that close up like? Was I, you know, smirking or was I smiling? You know, the, the whole thing is much more not being the distance you are in a theater for live shows um, which is a different kind of sense of, of portraying and, set, and sending out energy than it is when all of a sudden you're farther away and you're close. You're doing both those things and instantaneously. So it is uh, a different way of, of being a dancer and portraying a role um, for them and uh, especially as a director to make sure that they're going to be able to portray a role and it will come across on the camera. A lot more. Um maybe dramatic, you know, needing to be as dramatic as possible um, because of the close-ups and the, the, you know, audience being able to see their faces so clearly right. in the film. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, when you are on stage, you have to project much larger right. um, than you do in front of a camera. And so they had to be authentic without sort of over expressing, which was, was which is what you would actually do to get your expression across the footlights. So here it, had to, it actually had to pull it in in order for it to be more authentic um, without looking, you know, overly done. Mm -hmm. Make so sure you're being expressive, but natural. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what was it like to work at Heartwood? That was, it's such a beautiful scene, that first act. Were there any difficulties with you know, the room well, or the floor or anything? Well, it, it was wonderful. Our crew uh, put down a floor for us so that we wouldn't hurt their floor. And also for us to be able to have a surface that we felt safe on. Um, and Our production yeah. manager, Curtis, found a wood, like it, yeah. it looked like wood, marley, and put it down. So it looked like a wooden floor, but it was actually a marley. Yeah. Well, in it also, I thought it was actually going to be smaller than it actually turned out to be, and it turned out still small. I don't mean yeah. that we had a large space, but um, so it, to do some of the dancing in it, we felt a little cramped in there. But um, we were able to use the length of the room, and the, the, I thought the decor was beautiful, and, and the, the whole essence of being in the mansion uh, gave us a feeling of being in a Stahlbaum's home. Mm -hmm. um, and it came off very well. It, it's a different kind of feeling completely than being in the theater. You couldn't, um, you couldn't have done it on stage at the Benetton like that. Um, but to be it, actually in a real mansion um, and have stone and wood mm -hmm. around you and, and to be able to have you know, the tree and, the, and windows um, where we were lighting from outside to create moonlight um, for the evening performances of, of the evening party. Um, and then later for midnight, it would even have it darker and outside we'd change lights. And it would take a long time sometimes to set all of this up and get ready to do the shot. Um, sometimes the preparation was even longer than some of the simple shots that we would try to get done. Well, I mean, it's true, really, because actually there, there was a lot of setup and rehearsal, per se. I mean, like for, for all the magic boxes, I mean, that's what took all the time. I mean, once actually, okay, getting to filming, that went pretty quickly. Right. Right. The mansion was absolutely enchanting um, and authentic. Yeah. And, you know, when I 
had the moments to walk through the set, I felt like I was in the middle of the story. So mm -hmm. um, just having that was such a gift, such a gift to PBT that we could film there. Uh, we were so fortunate. And also the last scene. Yeah, the both inside and outside. Yeah, the outside was an incredible scene. The last scene and also in her bedroom. I mean, this yes. was all inside the mansion and then the, of course the last scene. So it was, I mean, we couldn't have asked for anything better. It was, it was glorious. Right. Yeah, when we walked into uh, the bedroom that they offered us, we were like, this is Marie's bedroom. We don't have to change anything. <laughs> we just take and put a few more props here and there. But I know, and Diana and was like, are you sure it's okay if I lie on the bed? You know, and, and with her point, it's like, I'm like, <laughs> trying to just be so very delicate. And <laughs> yeah. We do have a few questions from the audience and I appreciate um, everyone sending their questions in. We have quite a few, so I'm not sure we'll get to everything, but uh, let's see. So Susan, this one for you, are there any opportunities to collaborate artistically with PBT? And are there any works in development for the sake of honoring Patricia Wilde? Thinking about a collaboration in that way. Well, one of the things uh, I thought about when I arrived was I thought it would be amazing to have an evening celebrating all of our previous artistic directors and then having them all lined up on the stage and being able to ask them questions and you know have them share their stories with the audience. So the short answer is yet, or I guess that was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> the long answer was that, and the short answer is yes. Um, and I, I can't wait for that to happen. I can't wait for COVID to be over so that we can do that. And yes, also collaborating with PBT. If it's an artistic question, just send it over to me. Um, or if it's an administrative question, just send it over to our executive director. And uh, it's, or you can even just send it to info at, you know, information for PBT and then they'll forward it over to us. So, yes. Great. Uh, let's see, did the dancers find it at all difficult to give the same caliber of performance without a live audience present? No, I think sometimes that's an interesting question. I like that, um, but I think uh, it's funny, it, we're so used to rehearsing. It's not like we just give a performance all the time. You learn a line mm -hmm. and then you go out and you give a line. When, when you're learning a variation um, and you put it together and then you work on it for stamina and for um, growth as an artist, uh, there are times that you do a rehearsal that you really felt like, you know, you really nailed it. And the next day you come in and you didn't nail it the same way. It, you know, it just, it completely changes. And so the same thing happens um, when you're doing a performance on camera. The uh, camera all of a sudden is rolling and you know you might get nervous and then all of a sudden you're not doing the technique or you, you lost your line that was in your head, what you'd look like. Um, and then not only that, but you're gonna say wrap up this take and you're gonna do it the next day. You gotta come back and be able to replicate what you did and be able to go from a part of one scene and into the next. So. I think it uh, is a different way of working, but we do do it in a way in the fact that we do it not on stage, but we do it in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, and I, I, I mean, if, as far as performance wise, I mean, I feel like, I mean, when they were there doing, and that's why I thought um, Jessica and Yoshi were just so beautiful because I'm like looking at them and I'm thinking, I mean, they're, they're, they're performing, they're like, there, there's a whole audience out there. They're really um, sharing and, and giving. And I mean, all the dancers did. They came there yeah. and they did. They did their performance. Um, you know, I, yeah. As a performance, uh, you know, a, a, a perfectionist for dancers. They're they're always you know the little whatever technical things that I mean you're working to achieve. And sometimes they happen, and sometimes not quite the way you want them to. But it, it is just keep moving forward and. Um, the one thing about being on, on camera is the fact that, you know, if you really mess up <laughs> on stage, you're not getting away with it. You got oh, caught, yeah, okay. you know, there's 3000 people that just saw it. You made a mistake. Right, right. Um, and on camera, <laughs> you know, maybe there's times you can't even do a step, but most likely you're doing a role because you can do it. And so you're going to nail it at one point. 
Well, that kind of segues into our next question. Did it require multiple takes to achieve the flawless final product or was it approached as a live show? Well, I think we've answered that for the, <laughs> part, for the whole time because no, it, it'd be wonderful to say, oh, we started and we rolled the camera and we jumped from scene to scene and we did it in chronological mm -hmm. order, but absolutely impossible. <laughs> and no, th there's, there's, a, there's a lot more on the floor than there is that's hitting the screen. But just also- As there is with any movie. Right, and, you know, and getting shot in that, it, it, it was beautiful action, everything was perfect, but now, okay, he wants to take it from another angle and all of a sudden, you know, it just, it didn't quite happen the same way, but at least, um, well, you know, they're just options. So I don't know how many, well, the, That's why it's really important to edit it. When you see the, um, the awards on television, then you should always really admire the editor because <laughs> they are really the director. <laughs> Well, it's like writing a good letter, you know, it takes a very short amount of time to write a very, very long letter, and it takes a very, very long time to shorten it and make it That's clear right. and clean. That's so right. it's that way with everything. Yeah. That's right. Okay, and maybe our last question for this evening is, um, as my family watched, we enjoyed how the final scene showed Hartwood Estate blanketed in snow. Was this scene re-recorded following the winter storm that just made its way through Pittsburgh on Tuesday. I don't think we had really a storm even Tuesday, it was Wednesday, right? So, um, and we were wrapping up, I saw my first rough cut on Tuesday. So, but we did have just the storm that it was the very beginning of December. I wanna say it's like the third or fourth of December, something like that. And literally it, it only had snow on the ground that morning. It was frigid cold. Um, and we did it with uh, both Stephen and Joe that came out and did the outdoor scenes. We had done all the indoor scenes, but we hadn't done the outdoor scene, the, the snow. And, well, it was um, also too, you know, we warned Joe and he said, well, they're predicting snow. We hadn't had the snow yet. Right. Us, but we were predicting waking up with, with the snow. So everybody had their fingers crossed right. and then, okay, with the snow, it's a go. Um, That's right. Yeah. That was really a stroke of luck because <laughs> we never had snow again. It was gone by that afternoon or the next mm -hmm. day. And so, um, and that was really Christian again, um, talking about the fact that he wanted to, to that scene and he wanted to be able to get it. And he knew he couldn't get it when we were there because it looked like fall and leaves were falling. And it, you know, it definitely looked like fall. So at least if we'd gone back there, even without snow, the trees were gonna be barren and it was gonna look like winter even without snow, but we were lucky. Um, in finding that so scene. I thought it was brilliant using different lenses and getting that sense of moving away and seeing the mansion from one direction and then seeing the, the boys walking away and, and then also walking right toward the camera and seeing um, Marie and, and the house in the back. It was genius. Wow, that was... It was truly so really a gift, you know, from the gods that mm -hmm. we had that snowstorm. I mean, we could have not had a snowstorm this year, you know, up until but, now. So it was just incredibly fortuitous that suddenly we had this beautiful day of snow. So, yeah, the pivoting. I just remember getting a call in the morning. Oh, uh, uh, Stephen oh, can't be there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Stephen can't be there today because he's going to be at Hartwood filming. So, I mean, it was all a very quick pivot. So it was amazing. Well, it was a perfect ending to the film, perfect ending to the ballet and um, perfect ending for this program. So just wanna thank all three of you so much for being here this evening and thank our audience for watching and for also for viewing Fireside Nutcracker. We're thrilled that you're hopefully watched it last night and if not, we'll be watching it sometime before December 31st and just, uh, Thank you all, and we will see you in the new year. All right, take care, everybody. Happy, Thank happy, you. everybody. I know, happy, happy, happy healthy holidays. holidays. Mariana, show your, show your shirt. Stand up and show your shirt. It's the Nutcracker. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> all right, thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Good weekend.